Language. It's a pretty cool thing, quite useful. I can still remember back when I was a toddler, about two years old, learning my first language, English. My mom taught me how the order in English is subject, verb, object, and helped me make flashcards so I could memorize the vocabulary, and helped me for hours and hours to get the different verb tenses right. Fast forward several years, and in college I came over to Japan on a foreign exchange program where I would learn another language. About two years after arriving in the country, I took and passed the highest level of the Japanese language proficiency test. To be fair, I did live in the country, but the concepts I'll discuss in this video will be effective even if you don't have access to native speakers. Lately, there are all kinds of great resources and techniques on language learning. In particular, space repetition system-based virtual flashcard programs like Anki are very popular and can be very useful. But is that really the most efficient way to sync language into our brains so it can be used on the fly? After all, how many parents have to give their child a deck of flashcards for review to help their kids reach fluency in their mother tongue? Of course I was kidding earlier about my experience as a toddler. I learned English through magic, like every other baby. In this video, I'd like to discuss four not too often discussed points that I think are important when it comes to language learning. Acquiring language efficiently through context. Two is maximizing input. Three is practicing your listening and pronunciation at the same time. And four is making sure the experience of learning is positive. First, allow me to take a moment to demonstrate something. So just listen for now. If you already speak Japanese, it might be harder to get my point, but Hopefully you'll still see what I mean. Timu wo shoukai shi yo. Timu wa neko janakute, kaeru janakute, hito da. Hito no karada wa iron na bubun ga aru. Tatoeba atama, mune, ude, ashi ga aru. Okay, so just listening to me, how much Japanese did you learn from this? Maybe 0%. What if I repeated it or spoke slower? Would you learn more Japanese? Most likely not. Let's try it one more time, but pay attention to the screen. Timu wo shoukai shi yo. Timu wa neko janakute, kaeru janakute, hito da. Hito no karada wa iron na bubun ga aru. Tatoeba, atama, mune, ude, ashi ga aru. Mushi janai kara me wa mutsu toka janakute futatsu ga aru. Ude mo futatsu, ashi mo futatsu, mimi mo futatsu ga aru. How about now? Maybe 10%, 20%, or even just one word? This is the simple difference between acquiring language and not. What I'm trying to demonstrate is the concept of comprehensible input, as did second language acquisition scholar Stephen Krashen did in this lecture of his. Das ist meine Hand. Verstehen Sie das? Hand? In my opinion, we all acquire language the same way. We acquire language in one way when we understand messages, or when we understand what we read. We call this comprehensible input. We've tried everything else. We've tried grammar teaching, drills and exercises, computers, but the only thing that seems to count is getting messages you understand, comprehensible input. So anything that helps make input comprehensible, pictures, knowledge of the world, realia, etc., helps language acquisition. In the 1970s and 80s, Krashen put forward a group of hypotheses about language learning. The first claim of his we'll look at is that there is acquisition and learning, and Krashen says improvement in language ability is only dependent on acquisition and not learning. The difference between acquisition and learning is tricky, but it's kind of like the difference between getting a joke and having someone explain the precise reasons why the joke should be funny. For example, a horse walks into a bar and the bartender says, hey, why the long face? Or a whale walks into a bar and the whale says, If you thought this was funny, you didn't have to consciously work out why it was funny. The processing was done on a subconscious level. In Krashen's book, Principles and Practice in Second Language Acquisition, he says acquisition of language is a natural, intuitive, and subconscious process of which individuals need not be aware. Similarly, you can learn words by having someone tell you the Japanese word for persimmon is kaki. On the other hand, what's necessary for acquisition is sufficient comprehensible input. Something like this. Ringo wo taberu. Ringo wo taberu. So, even though you might not know any of the words I just said, you could comprehend the pictures I supplied. 
And based on that context, you could acquire the meaning of dingo and taberu. When I provide you with another example, biru o nomu. You may have deduced something about the Japanese grammar as well. That's right, the verb comes at the end. The point is, you have this massive pattern recognition device jammed into your head, and when you understand the meaning of the message, your brain will naturally pick out vocabulary and deconstruct grammar patterns based on the context. And this is not something you actively and consciously perform. This leads me to one of the most helpful things. Simply watching television series without English subtitles, with focused attention, even though I couldn't understand most of it. And today, I want to talk about dictionaries. You can look up the word get in the dictionary, and you get eight or nine different definitions, and you can read that. Close the dictionary and you won't remember much of what was there. Before I went to Vietnam, I got this phrase book and dictionary. I came away able to use one word, come on, which means thank you. Nothing else stuck, zero. This was essentially useless. A bit later on, I tried my hand at plenty of books, but refrained from looking up every word. This is a really simple but important concept. How many new words, phrases, and grammar structures can you feed your brain? When you're looking up every word as you read a book, you take about half an hour to get through one page. For the same amount of time, a television show can blast you with far more words, phrases, and grammar. A book can too, if you're not so trigger happy with the dictionary. And it might not feel like it, but these bits of cloudy information can stick in your head at the subconscious level, just waiting for the right context to reveal their meaning. Engineering professor Barbara Oakley explains here that we have two modes of thinking the focused mode and the diffuse mode. The focused mode is where you're racking your brain, trying to use your focused awareness to figure something out, whether it be a math problem or what's going on in a TV show in a foreign language. The diffuse mode works in the background when you're relaxed and not straining on one thing. It can see the big picture and make connections. This is thought to be why so many people get ideas in the shower. You're relaxed, probably not focused on anything in particular, so your subconscious starts turning its pattern recognition gears to give you insights your conscious mind couldn't see. You might not have any luck picking up many words or phrases while watching or reading something, but when you go off and do something else, your brain relaxes into the much more flexible diffuse mode and uses its powers of pattern recognition to piece out some meaning from the heaps of language information you were just exposed to. Now, I'm not saying the fastest way to become fluent in a language is to never open a dictionary, but you'll want to invest a majority of your time on inputting a bunch of content into your head from media, books, or just paying attention to people around you. Earlier, we saw that according to Krashen, acquisition, but not learning, can trigger an improvement in the language. But it seems deliberate learning can trigger language acquisition sort of retroactively. For example, Let's say you had seen this scene before. And you knew that just means my cake. But for the life of you, you couldn't figure out what kuttaro means. You were guessing it means steal. Then at some point, you learn from a textbook or dictionary that ku is a very casual way to say eat. Then it all clicks. You realize kutta would be the past tense of this verb. And you figure out kuttaro must be the same as kutta daro. Now you've acquired a new word and a new colloquialism and put all the pieces together to fully understand what this guy was saying. <laughs> this is the aha moment indicative of new language acquisition. Similar to a joke, it just happens at the subconscious level. Another key to this is watching television without English subtitles. A study from Barcelona looking at Spanish speakers trying to learn English found that the worst way to learn was by putting Spanish subtitles on an English movie. This resulted in a 0% improvement in their English ability. Watching with no subtitles provided a 7% improvement, but watching the show in English with English subtitles provided a 17% improvement. 
Now you might be thinking, how are you ever going to learn anything if you do all this input without any speaking practice? This is where another part of Krashen's theory comes in. And this may come as a bit of a surprise to some of you. Certainly came as a surprise to me. Talking is not practicing. It means if you want to improve your Spanish, it will not help you to speak Spanish out loud in the car as you drive to work in the morning. I used to think those things help. Now I think they don't. You don't technically have to open your mouth to acquire a language. This was demonstrated in 1962 when E. Lennonberg described the case of a boy who could not speak due to congenital dysarthria. When Lennonberg tested the boy, he found that the child was able to understand spoken English perfectly. With that said, you should open your mouth at some point. Pronunciation is of course very important. But pronunciation is hard. You'll notice some noises in the language you just can't make because you never have before. That's not too bro. That's, that's not too bro. This brings me to a technique called shadowing. What you do is basically listen to some audio of a native speaker talking and you just mimic their pronunciation and intonation. Not every word though. Depending on your level, it could be two syllables at a time, three at a time, or two words at a time, and so on. Shadowing is generally thought of as an advanced technique you should use to master your intonation and polish up your accent. But even from day one, it can be a super efficient way for improving your pronunciation and at the same time your ability to recognize phonemes in natural language. That is, to hear natural language. And being able to hear natural language is important because when people speak naturally, there are certain phrases where their speech gets run together. Like, what are you doing becomes, what are you doing? Watch how in this scene, Abe Hiroshi turns tokoro ga koyatte into a 2015 study from Japan looking at two groups of English learners found that indeed, shadowing made statistically significant improvement in phoneme perception for both groups. Look in the description for some tips on shadowing so you can get more out of it without frustrating yourself into hating the language. So that's it. Three main things. Focus on learning from context load up on input and get plenty of content in the target language. And you can use the same audio source to practice your listening to natural speech and pronunciation. I realize this leaves many questions regarding language learning and that there's tons of useful techniques and approaches for learning a language that I haven't addressed here. So please leave a comment if you have any questions and check the description for more information. This video was brought to you by the online community and virtual classroom Skillshare. The thing that I really like about Skillshare is that it has something for everyone. I've recently been keen on maximizing the DHA content of my diet, so naturally, this Skillshare course on fish by chef Ken Oranger really came in handy. With just a little time investment into learning how to select the freshest fish, I feel like a pro whenever I walk into the seafood section of my grocery store and feel more confident that I'm bringing home good quality, nourishing seafood. If raw fish isn't your thing, there's still thousands more classes in design, marketing, business, and technology. Another course I got a lot of value out of was this one by Gary Vaynerchuk on social media strategy. Like the other classes you'll find on Skillshare, it's professional, organized, and has very clear and actionable points. An annual premium membership is less than just $10 a month, and it gives you unlimited access to quality classes from experts working in their field. The first 500 people to click my link in the description can get two months of Skillshare Premium for free. After that, it's as low as $10 a month to keep on learning with Skillshare.